the problem is it's this kind of algorithms, if you put in one node, it's really hard to make lock free. I mean, the, the ray based queues are hard uh, to make lock free in a realizable way. I mean, it's, it's more expensive. So, I mean, in this unfortunately, the, the state of the art in lock free data structures. Uh, most of the state of the art lock free data structures are list based. Uh, just because it's easier to design list based log free data structures. And like state of the art uh, array based decks, they only do uh, provide you with abstraction freedom and still lose in performance uh, quite significantly to list based structures. I mean, that's, I mean, I mean we can talk more about it, but I'm not sure that's the state of the art. I mean, I would love if somebody produces a paper on practical array based log free algorithms, but they know where to be found. Uh, so, it's all linearizable and proving, oh, excuse me. Yeah. It's just hard. I mean, it requires like code instrumentation. It's not as just writing a test. I mean, it's, it's very hard to write a test that was, a, that's exactly what you should do. You should stop, but the end, you, I mean, it's, I think about the whole framework, you should be stopping them at different times, you know, it will definitely be way, way more consuming than stress test than just test correctness. I mean, but yeah, that's probably the way you should take. I, I didn't do it. I just, you know, look the code carefully to convince myself it's still look free. L linearization of this algorithm is really easy to prove just because the way it's structured. So whenever I insert item, whenever I successfully cast next pointer, that's the linearization point. Whenever I removed element, whenever the cast happened, the first one, which logically removed the element by, by mark, that's it. It's linearized at this, this particular point. So, I mean, and so this is kind of algorithm who, which, whose realizability is easy to prove because of a clearly defined uh, linearization point. But the algorithm itself, that's if you read the paper, uh, they also provide you with operations to remove at the left, uh, or to insert at the left, to remove at the right. So uh, uh, the original paper by Sandal and Sigas, they present the whole deck operations. Both ways, both sides of the list can be manipulated. And uh, removing left is really simple. You just read next and perform remove, but the interesting in a completely non-obvious thing about the full deck operations that if you do a full deck with all four operations, re remove insert on the left and remove insert on the right, you cannot linearize all of them simultaneously at their, their cast points. Uh, when you have all four operations, the uh, pop left will linearize at not cast, but will realize at actual read of the pointer. And this fact will prove it really hard for us to combine it with other atomic data structures. It just, fortunately, we in our particular case don't need it. We don't use this operation, pop left. And even if we used, uh, it would be proved completely fatal to our attempts to do other operations atomically. This really not obvious that as more operations you add to data structures, it changes the way, we, the way nature, how they behave. But we'll, we'll, I will actually, I'll give you an example later on of what exactly would be a problem if we were trying to, to, to uh, remove left item from it. So a little bit about implementation. So I've already stressed that we are using garbage collection. I also stress that the, the actual, we actually, there's no reason to actually have two sentinels. One is enough. And empty list is just one object. And if we have, uh, uh, one uh, element list that will in reality look like this. So we'll have merged Sentinel, just one pointer to it, and th that's it. That's how it will actually look when we implement it. By the way, this pointer to the queue never changes, it's fixed. So it's Sentinel, it's, it's next and previous pointers change. You know, this object gets inserted, removed. The interesting thing about this is that we will also reuse mark objects. So whenever we remove this item, it has to replace these two references to next to prayer with marked reference to Sentinel. And it will have just one marked reference to Sentinel that is cached in the Sentinel node itself. So this way, if we add an element and remove it, it's just one garbage object, one object of garbage. We allocate one object, we leave it to garbage. So as long as our list stays small, like 
we're just adding a weight to our towel list, removing it. Uh, that's it. There's little garbage, just one node. That's all the garbage we have. It's despite we have a bunch of casts, yes, but they're nowadays pretty fast uh, without contention. So this is really practical algorithm. It's the original paper it was termed practical for a reason. It's really practical in practice, performs really fast. And of course, we encapsulate. Whenever we do something in practice as complex as this algorithm, we always encapsulate it into a separate class, you know, test it separately, and then use it to do larger things. So now we have this shiny toy, this algorithm. So we studied the paper, understood how it works, implemented, tested, it works. Now let's play with this shiny toy a little bit. Let's see what else we can do with this algorithm that was not originally intended by its authors. Let's modify it to do more complex operations. And the first ones will be easy. The first is conditional insertion. When we insert an item, we're casting this next pointer. And we're casting it in the last node. So in addition, so we can easily check what is stored in this last node and make our insertion conditional on the value of last item. Without, it's a really simple modification. Like before doing this cast, we'll check if some predicate about this last node is true. And if it's true, we go ahead with cast. If it's not, uh, abort false. Very easy and uh, doesn't require any changes to the algorithm itself. Uh, so that's it. The same with removal. When we remove an item, that's the item we have to cast. And we can check the contents of the first node. And the contents of the node, remember, never change. We just add nodes with new candidates, remove them. The contents in the node themselves never change the final values. So we can check this some predicate here. And if it's not true, not remove it, return false. If it's OK, go for it. So conditional insertion and conditional removal is really easy. It's really straightforward modification of this algorithm. Why we need it? And that's, thanks for waiting for so long. Now we'll present the actual use case. Why would we ever need such a complex algorithm with conditional appearance? What, what would you, why would you ever need this in practice? Like great theory, you know, write a paper. But practice, why would you ever need it? So there it is. The use case is really simple, synchronous channels. So what are synchronous channels? Synchronous channels is this really simple communication data structure that you can create. And the idea is this, you can have one coroutine that sends element and the other coroutine receives the element. And the task of the synchronous channel to, to arrange a rendezvous between those coroutines. So we create channel, one sends, the other received. What's rendezvous? It's then if I send and another coroutine is not reached receive, I get suspended. When the other coroutine box received, this one resumes, they continue. If I restart to receive and no one sending, I get suspended. I wait until sender comes and we rendezvous and go forward. That's synchronous channels. I mean, that's basic construct in all the uh, CSP and actor style programming. Uh, so how do we actually implement this? It looks great, nice abstraction. How we implement this nice abstraction so it's scalable? We implement it with a list of waiters or senders or receivers. So the list will be, that's our list. And if we have more, if senders wait for incoming receivers, then we have a queue of senders who were suspended trying to send. And more senders uh, will add themselves to the right and receivers will take senders from the left. If the, we have another case, receivers wait, then this queue will contain receivers. More receivers will come on the right and senders will uh, remove from the left. Okay, that's conceptual grid, but how we're we gonna implement it. That's how we, here's a sketch of send function. What it will do, it will do a loop, and it will, in this loop, it will try to add a sender conditionally if the last item is not a receiver. So it will only add itself as a sender only if it's filled, is it empty or filled with other senders. It will never queue itself to the end if there are other receivers waiting. If that fails, if the success brag, if that fails, then we'll try to remove first receiver from the list as conditional remove. We remove item only if it's a receiver node. And if we removed it, we'll resume this receiver and give it that's rendezvous. We resume receiver directly passing it, our element. Elements themselves in synchronous queue, synchronous channel, elements never queued. It's 
uh, uh, carotenes that wait to send and receive are cute. Elements are not. Yeah. Of uh, channel, Sihon's channel has to arrange a rendezvous. So you have if carotenes that send has to wait until somebody starts receiving, and then there is a rendezvous between themselves. You receive this one item from this one sender, and there can be multiple senders and multiple receivers. And Rendezvous is 1-1, one, one. so that's why we have a queue. So we have a queue of sender. If receiver comes in, it removes the sender from the list, resumes the sending carotene, and goes on. If receivers are waiting and senders come in, it removes the receiver from the list, resumes this one receiver, the other receivers keep waiting. Uh, the elements themselves are not stored into the queue. Elements only transferred through rendezvous directly from sender to receiver. So only when they rendezvous they meet, they, they perform the transfer of the element. We only queue if there's too many senders, no receivers, or too many receivers, no senders. When the one one rendezvous happens, they just pass the element within themselves. It is producer consumer ways fan out. I mean, you can have multiple receivers and they will they will not broadcast elements, each of them will receive. So if I have one sending carotene and multiple receiving, like one, uh, the items that I send, each of the items will be received only by one. And they will actually do round robin because it's like fee for queue. So multiple, you know, carotenes receiving will pick the carotenes fee for. And I can have a multiple senders that will put themselves in a fee for queue. But the elements are not queued, only attempt to send and receive is queued. So if bunch of senders come in, they'll wait until receivers appear. That's its synchronous nature. The queue itself has no buffer. That's what they say. Elements are not buffered. It's only, only we're only wait, only the list of waiting, uh, sending and receiving carotines. And that's why we, yeah. It's not, the Java threading library doesn't have these primitives because again, it's usually used in highly concurrent code. When you have hundreds of thousands, you know, uh, actors communicating, and you, it never happens with, uh, it's not popular in the, you know, in the threads world. You know, it's only popular in this fine-grained, you know, concurrency world, where you have lots of lots of tasks communi communicating. So you won't find these primitives in, uh, in, it's, if you do this thing with a buffer of limited size, it will be similar than to array buffered queue. There's also implementation with buffer when we want uh, go how this works, but that one will be similar to the uh, to the queue. This now actually this is similar to Exchanger because if I have multiple threads uh, trying to exchange, they all wait, and and some if. I mean, it, it is somewhat, oh no, I mean, no. Exchangers don't queue, they, they, in Java Exchanger, you don't specify the role. There's no role specification, just do two, or do, I don't remember. I don't remember. It's, it might be similar to Exchanger, maybe not. <laughs> uh, the trick here is it, this thing has to scale to really large number of coroutines. We, I mean, there can be many, and this, the senders can abandon send, they can cancel, remove themselves from the list and go do something else, yeah. Can do what? In order to send over networks, you would typically do this as a separate carotene that receives element that performs the actual I.O. Sending out the other end, some carotene will be receiving, put into a channel, and then the rest of the code will be just receiving it from a channel. Yes, you have to implement, you have to write some some adapter that adapts the channel to the to the some physical communication medium, but you can isolate it through the channel, you can isolate it, the actual communication from the rest of the code, because it will look like a channel from the rest of the code, and when I send an element to the channel, I don't care what happens next. It can be an actor. I can, like in actor-based programs, I typically send to a channel element and my own channel where I want to receive a reply, or something like that. So, but it doesn't matter. I just, you know, all I do, I, you know, in the CSP style, all my code does is uh, the bunch of agents sending, you know, messages over channels to each other. 
yeah, we do plan. We do plan to do some networking, but it won't be based on object-based channels. It will be based on byte-based channels because you know in networking, here we're just exchanging objects, and in networking you usually say of packets of bytes. So we will a little different abstract level. But anyway, let's go forward. So that's why we need those conditional sends receive, and this pressure is also a loop. So it's log free. It's not exactly fair. So one sender can loop forever, never be able to enqueue itself, nor remove a receiver, but it is log free in the usual sense, you know, in the usual sense of volume. So this is our log free send procedure. Yeah. And QSend will add a sender to the list if and only if it doesn't look like this. If it's not a, a receiver's waiting, but it looks like this, it's empty or sender word, it did add yet another sender. It will conditionally add item if the previous one is sender or sentinel, if it was contained sender or empty. And if this list is just written false, it won't do anything, instead it will go to next line and will try to remove the first receiver to resume it. Because there are two cases, receiver's weight or sender's weight. So if receiver's weight, we have to, uh, we have to wake up the first receiver. Sender's weight, we have to stand in the queue ourselves. So we either add ourselves as the next waiter, or we take the first receiver and wake him up to, you know, that's it. And that's why it's structured like this loop. Either add ourselves as the last sender, and that's conditional adding to queue operation. Or remove first receiver, and that's also conditional remove, because we're only here to remove the first node if it is a receiver waiting node, not, not anything else. It's, it's used inside, in QSend is our conditional insert and uh, remove first is our conditional remove. It's hidden, it's encapsulated inside, it's encapsulated inside. And this is also encapsulated. All the end users see, they see this nice, fast send operation. They don't have to, fortunately, they don't have to understand all of this. We have to implement it. And we have to implement all those log free algorithms. Uh, so let's recap. Uh, so we use insert, conditional insert remove, conditional tail head. We can abort, send receive because we can one remove the node from the list. No garbage is left. Removal is complete, which is great. So we can have a channel full with senders, but senders time out. New senders come time out. No garbage. No, no, nothing is left linked into the list. Uh, it's pretty efficient in practice. It's you know shows good practical performance. And, uh, you know, one item list, usually we don't have this many senders, many receivers, so usually I'll list just one item, and they're pretty, pretty efficient. So now, let's build even bigger atomic operations, for which we'll need ability to do multi-word compare and swap. And in order, before we go forward to present you compare and swap algorithm uh, by Harris et al., well, I'll do motivational part. So I'll say why we need it first, and then explain the algorithm. And because this is actually a simpler algorithm. This is the kind of algorithm you can, uh, once you understand it, you can just sit down and write the code. You don't have to read the actual paper after that. Uh, the motivation is this. My motivation is uh, we want to be able to wait on multiple channels simultaneously. So we want to be able to say select, and if something is received on first channel, do this. If something is selected on the second channel, do this. So, and how do we implement waiting on multiple channels? The way we implemented it is this. First, we have to register ourselves as waiting for a save. In order to register ourselves, we have the status object for the whole receive operation, which is just not selected yet or selected. We already know which channel we receive the element from. And so the way we do it is we add node to channel one if if only need select is not selected yet. So this is higher atomicity operation. It involves two separate objects. We have to enqueue an item into the channel if uh, the, there's no item on other channels. Because if we receive a channel on other items and have enqueued ourselves, it, it's too late to go back. Because as soon as we put ourselves in the queue, that's it, some sender may see it and, you know, think that it successfully sent, you know, go do something else. We can't go back. There's no way we can undo the operation. Once we're in the queue, that's it. 
So before we have to be careful when we add, we have to add ourselves to the queue only if no nothing was selected yet. And the same way we add ourselves to the other queue. We add ourselves, and we can actually register this way ourselves in as many queues as you want. Every time we register an additional queue, uh, we check that uh, we're not selected yet. What happens when the, we actually try to resume this item? We wait then, uh, waiting for us either receive something in the first queue or the other queue, and then, you know, for example, something happens on the second queue. In this case, we marked this select as selected atomically with removing it from the queue. We have to do atomically because there may be cases where elements come concurrently here and here. So we have to combine marking this as selected with removing into one single atomic operation. They have to both happen at the same time, this mark and removing. And after that, we can just remove uh, our cells from the other queue uh, because, you know, when we, uh, it's no problem. Something rest of the other queue, it will fail to, uh, to make this selected because it's already selected. So we'll need this more complex atomic operation in order to implement this kind of select statement. That's, that's why we need, we need the ability to combine multiple operations on multiple data structure, multiple words of memory into a single atomic operation. We could have used STM here, but we would use a more efficient algorithm that is tuned to our particular problem. And we would start with the primitive called double compare single swap. This primitive is a building block in, that's explained in the highest paper. That's a building block for multi-word comparison set. The, the way it, the pseudocode for this building block is real simple. So what it does, it does comparison set. So it, there are two references, A and B. And what we want to do, we want to change the reference A if it's equal to expected value. Only if the B is equal to the other expected value at the same time. So it's DCSS, double compare, single swap. It's like CAS, but with an additional check. And this is just pseudocode. We want this, all of this happen atomically. These checks of two variables, this something happen as one atomic indivisible operation. Atomically means linear, it has to be linearizable with respect to everything else that's going on. So how are we doing? So that's, we have A, B, you know, that's all parameters. And uh, if both equal, we update. How we do it? We start with creating descriptor of the operation. So we allocate a separate object that records what is the operation we're about to do. And uh, we'll walk through a successful case. What happens is operation successful. So initially A is equal to expected value and B has the reference to expected value. So we create descriptor, it's private object, not yet published anywhere. And in the first step, we do a cast. We change pointer from expected to our descriptor. So now instead of A, instead of pointing to expected value, it holds the pointer to descriptor. And this point descriptor has become published. So, I mean, if other threads, it's, it's actually, it's other thread comes in and discovers it, that this reference is not real value, but a pointer to descriptor, it will uh, invoke complete operation to help this operation complete. So it can then figure out what's the actual value of A, you do something about it. Uh, the next step is actual completion of this operation. So what do we do? We read the bare value, and if it's equal to what we expect it to be, then we cast A to updated value. That's it, it's over. Descriptor can be garbage collected, really short-lived object. is more than garbage collection, really efficient about this short-lived object. We created it only for a very short duration of this operation. That's it. We're done, we've completed our operation. In, if we read, the value instead and found it's not equal to expected value, then we cast it back A to what it was before. Again, operation complete, now with a failure, nothing updated. And again, you know, descriptor free to be garbage collected. In order to understand why this algorithm really works, you have to look at its state diagram. So this is, this, yeah. So the steps are this, we prepare by 
casting expected A to descriptor. Then we read B. If it's equal to expected, we cast A to updated value. We is a first cast. First cast, we cast this pointer. This is a cast. Only if it's equal to expected, we change it to descriptor. Only in this case. This is a cast. Uh, let's the the other way to look at it is look at a state diagram, which is really simple. And by looking, it's actually the easiest way to prove the algorithm. This algorithm is correct is by looking at the state because the state diagram is very embodies the proof of correctness of this algorithm, B because. The initial state is initial state. We have descriptors created. A contains something we don't know. And that's it. That's our initial state. It's not published yet. No, no other thread knows about our descriptor. Just a local to our operation that's trying to do this uh, double comparison single swap. If A actually contained expected value, then we move to this step. Now A contains pointer to descriptor. And in this step, We've published reference to the descriptor. If some other thread encounters the object and the pointer, it will help complete. What it will what it will happen? It will either it will read you know B and will either move to this state. A becomes updated if B was equal to expected B, or it will move to this failure to fifth state if it wasn't expected. There's also state number four. This one. If we initial cast fails, then we inside one thread just fail the whole operation. This script was never published, it wasn't e ever published. And this is failure if we just keep published and it fails. This is the complete, yeah. It, it knows because descriptor, remember when we created descriptor, we recorded everything about the operation to descriptor. Of course. Because this descriptor stores everything, e e including what will we expected. So what we'll have to restore it if it fails, or what the value is updated that we'll have to put it if it succeeds. Descriptor records all parameters of our operation. That's why any thread that tries to read A and sees that it doesn't contain a value but contains a descriptor instead, and it's really easy in object-oriented languages to check if A is instance of operation descriptor, then you help it complete. Hold on. We did not specify that we care about whether... See, the trick is that this operation doesn't have result. We don't have to learn if it's successful or not. And in particular, this is how it's specified in Harris's work. Because Harris's algorithm that will follow up doesn't need to know whether it's successful or not. But you're right. Sometimes we, for other needs, like remember, we wanted to add ourselves to the queue if and only if the queue is not selected yet. And we actually want to know whether this operation was successful. We want to use DCSS here. We want to know. So sometimes we need, so let's then modify the, this, uh, this algorithm uh, so that we can learn uh, the, the, the step. But if we want to modify it, there is one caveat. Locations of IB has to be totally ordered. Like uh, we can't just take two random, we have to order. I mean, it's not that we have to take any pair of memory locations. Hold on just a second. And there has to be total order between memory. And in Harris's work, uh, or there will be stack overflow while helping. The one thread is doing this is A and B, and the other doing B and D, and they both write descriptors first, and then just you know loop forever stack overflow helping themselves. So this important in this algorithm, we have to order memory locations. It can be random. So in Harris's work, one way to look at it is to look at restricted DCSS operation. That's how it's specified in Harris's work. He, Harris says locations B can only come from a separate subset of memory locations. It's basically the same as saying A and B are totally ordered. This algorithm is completely lock free and it's easy to do by looking at this diagram. There's always forward progress on this diagram. Every time you encounter a thread in one of those states, you this descriptor, you make a forward progress. Like, no, it's not weight free. It's just lock free because it's all structured like a, uh, no, sorry. This algorithm is actually weight free because this is this, and this I forgot to mention because I'm hurrying up. 
we were in a tough, tough time because this algorithm is one of those. Uh, it's actually it it is actually wait for because it has no loops inside. It's all this algorithm has not a single loop inside itself. It always does goes forward with casts. So it does one cast, another cast, or one cast, another cast. If it fails cast, it doesn't have to retry because it cast failed. It knows some other tree did it. Other three did it. So it's actually wait for algorithm. That's a good correction. Thank you. This is actually we don't care. I don't need it in practice, but it's good to know. So let's modify it. Let's figure out how to learn about the result. So what if we want to return a boolean? What if our formal specification requires us to learn what was the outcome, whether it was true, we updated, or was false, we failed, like just cause this. And the technique we'll use it to learn is very important. It's not just the way it's implemented, it's easy, because technique is that we'll use it to learn the outcome is universal applicable. The way to do it is to add outcome field to the descriptor. And unlike the rest of the field, the rest of the fields in descriptor are final, they never modify. But this is actual modifiable field with outcome and it will uh, be the field for consensus between threads. I mean, there can be initiated set multiple helping threads and that's the consensus between those threads on whether we succeeded or failed. How is it going to work? It start as usual we install ourselves as descriptor. Then we check if base equal to equal. After checking, we first reach consensus. So we cast this outcome to success, or if that's success. And only after doing that, we complete operation. If it, so the state diagram becomes, it takes additional step. So in successful path, we start by allocating, we, Publish descriptor, outcome is still undecided. If success, we just mark it as successful. It's not over yet. There's one more step. We have to complete update. But it's still linear. Any thread that comes to seed can help us finish this procedure. And if it fails initially, it just fails, but it fails here, the same. We first mark it as a failed operation, then we complete it. So this kind of it's like a saying, like every uh, problem in computer science is solved by another layer of indirection, right? So this is another layer of indirection. So directly complete. We indirectly we first update the status and then complete. And a status is consensus. It has very simple state diagram. It 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 can uh, it has initial state is undecided and it can become successful or failed. That's it. It's implements really simple consensus protocol, really basic. That's simple modification in this approach to modifying algorithm is universal. We can use it for uh, other algorithms if we need to learn their outcome. Still no loops here. Still one more cast, no loops. So it's still weight free. You're right. So now the ultimate atomic update. Now that's actually the essence of Harris's paper and I can personally consider this a groundbreaking paper because it's the first really practical algorithm. It's really good in practice that lets you do compare and swap on as many words as you want. Uh, so that specification will consider a case of two words but it's easily done on as many words as we want. So we have uh, one reference, what we expect it to be, what to update it and the second reference and we atomically want to check if they're equal to expected values, update them and return true. Or if something wrong, return false. So we want to do this atomic operation and learn this result. It has to return a boolean. So, so we start in the same way as before. We create descriptor. It remembers everything about operation, everything. And it has an outcome because, because we have to learn what the outcome was, but that's not the only reason. And you'll see a little bit later. First, we cast descriptor to our first reference, start as before. First, we announce that operation about to happen on those words. But then something interesting happens. This is the moment when the operation became published. And now we have to be careful because other threads may see this descriptor and come to help. And this help may become at any later point of time. We may have 
completed this operation 10 times and reverted it all back, and some helper might wake, who learned about this group might wake up and, oh, I decide to help. So that's why then we do further installation of this descriptor publishing. We do it conditionally. We use this previous double compare single swap operation to install descriptor into be only if and only if you know the outcome was still undecided. We don't do this if you know it reached decision. Then we reach consensus. We know it's success. We successfully installed it. And then we update it to final value in A, update it to final value in B. So the state diagram of it is also a living proof that it's correct. And it's really actually really simple. It starts with a not published descriptor that I decided yet. It, the descriptor gets installed into A. The descriptor gets installed into B, but this is done with conditionally upon the fact that it's yet undecided. And then we mark outcome as successful. As long as we did it, outcome mark, nobody else can reinstall this descriptor. Because helpers will try to reinstall this descriptor into Beth because helpers can encounter the data structure insert in this second state. And having encountered it, they will try to help. And the first step to help is to try to install it in B. So because, we, but because this happens with double compare single swap, they will fail because we've already marked it successful and we do this conditional upon the fact that separation is yet undecided. Then we complete by updating updating B. If it fails at some point, it's easy depending where it fails. So it fails initially, we just mark it fail. If it fails, you know, after it fails to uh, update B because B is equal to a different value. It's not an expected value. We mark out failed and then we'll complete by, uh, by reverting A to expected value. That's it. And again, no loops in this diagram. Everything just goes in forward direction. Yeah. Uh, it's okay. I mean, threads from, th because this is consensus, this is CAS. Undecided to, this is, this is a CAS operation to reach consensus. It's okay if some other threads marks it successful too. No, no, I mean, the, the way it's implemented is easy. We perform this step locally, and then we just call helping procedure, just like anybody else. And at the end, when it finishes, you know, that's the only two terminal states. And we can just read the outcome and see what the result was. We don't care what it returns. We care about what it puts in the outcome field. That's what we'll read. We'll do the helping steps, whether they success or succeed or fail, and then we just read the value of outcome field, which has to be decided, because we just helped it into deciding direction. Yeah, so the, after they fail to cast, they, so if threat tries to make a decision and it fails, it reads what the outcome was. And depending on the outcome, proceeds either helping in this direction if it failed, if the consensus is failure, or if it reads outcome field and see oh, other threads has already reached a consensus that it's success, then it will proceed helping into this direction. And this helping does was cast it. So what we do, we cast this description to the destination value. And no loops here. Cast here, cast here. If somebody else already did it, okay. If we're the first one to do, great. We'll, we'll move this object to its final destination. There's no return value, the helper said. Helper threads do not have, only the originator of operation has a return value. Only the original invoker of the operation, so the way it works, original worker creates an object, publishes it, invokes helping procedure, then reads outcome and returns it. And helping process is universal. Any thread that encounters a descriptor starts helping. How it starts helping? First, and first it does, uh, let's see if I can help this step. No. There's no, because helping has no result. When we help, we'll help while somebody, some thread comes in and tries to read the value of A. 
when it tries to read the value of else, instead of the actual value, it finds the descriptor of ongoing operation. No, it, no, it doesn't mean it's failed. It's, it means that the operation is in progress. So it will involve helping processor. It doesn't matter what it returns. The only matter when helping processor completes, the descriptor is no longer there. We can now reread the value. It helps and restarts reading the value. By the way, it's just log free because it may start reading somebody else started another operation. So it goes into the loop, read value, if descriptor help, we read value. The helping processor doesn't have a result. So these are two states are critical. That's where we reach consensus. So using it in practice, I mean, can I have five more minutes? Or we can actually, I mean, I, I think we have time. I mean, I will a little bit show how we actually use this uh, for a larger concurrency. So it's also the little things that matter. It's like a Russian saying, that's, you know, гладко было на бумаге, но забыли про враги. It was, you know, flat on paper, but we forgot about the gullies, you know. Uh, so, uh, in practice, it's not so easy. It's not just you take this n word cast and apply it to some data structure. Because it's only easy to combine multiple operations when all the descriptive parameters are known in advance. And a trivial example is Traber's stack. So you remember, that was the day number one, I believe, where you know, we were showing the Traber stack. When you add an element to Traber stack, you do a single cast. And you know all the parameters of this cast in advance. You know what is an, a field to modify. You know what's expected value. That's the current top. What you update it to, the new node you're trying to insert to the stack. So you can, because of that, because Traber stack is as simple, you can combine as operations on as many Traber stacks as you want to do a single atomic operation just by using multi-word compare and set. Because you know what cast you're going to do to linearize your operation in advance. So create description with all your casts and do it atomically upon all stacks at the same time. But, you know, in our case, we, it's not that simple. Like, I don't know any publisher to research. I actually, I believe there is a paper by Sandal that generalizes it and basically proves formally that if your data structure is this kind that you know in advance, what's the parameters, then you can combine them. But it's not the case for us. Because let's look at insert. We're doing cast here. But we, so we can create descriptor of this operation, but we don't know what reference we're going to update. Before we start operation, we don't know. We'll have to read this pointer only to learn where. We know what to expect. We know we have to expect Sentinel. We know where to update it to. Because that will be node will be inserted, we will know where to update. So, but the problem is, the in general algorithm we cannot modify descriptor on the fly. Descriptor has to be a final object. It, it, the only thing we allow it to modify is outcome. So what do we do? Uh, we don't expect it. We don't update it. We don't know reference. So we need to always use double compare single set here. Uh, even if it's first operation. Remember, when we published our first descriptor, we didn't need uh, DCSS, but here we'll use it always. So we'll create a DCSS descriptor for this. That's, so we won't fill this reference, because first time we'll do it, we'll always do it through DCSS, which will remember what node we're trying to affect and what operation it's part of. So we'll learn what's the last node, create DCSS, and we'll try to do this DCSS as a part of RSS algorithm. DCSS will conditionally install the pointer to our description if outcome is still undecided. So, and if we manage to cast it successfully, so we manage to successfully cast DCSS descriptor into the next node, that's our chance. We know inside DCSS what node we're affecting, and we can copy this information into the operation descriptor. And that's every helper will go through the state. So before going to subsequent states in our state diagram, it will go through this one. So in this instrument, this part of the operation will be already filled. And then this CSS will go away, it goes to garbage, and we just replace this. We've successfully installed our operation into the next node, uh, and we know all its parameters. And we can install as many other operations the same. So we can have a very big descriptor that describes very complicated atomic operations that modifies lots of cues at the same time, or lots of objects at the same time. We can 
insert in two queues simultaneously if we want. We don't really need this in practice, we can. Or do this operation combined with some other cast. So, I mean, we'll skip remove because remove is similar. So, the same DCSS helps us in the same way. There's more unknowns, but it works the same way. But the trick is we remove is it only actually works because we never change, send, we never insert anything at the top. I mean, it's a really tricky case where the whole algorithm works just because we don't have a specific operation here. Uh, because while we're inserting ourselves, nobody will come in to uh, insert themselves at the top because we simply don't support this operation. We only support insertion at the end. So that will help us be sure that we're still the first element that we're, uh, is being removed. And descriptor is updated, and then operation proceeds. So, close your nose. It works just because there's a single cast that is our operation. And everything happens after that, just helping. We, when we implement combined multiple operations, we don't care what helping moves are. We don't care how this correct pref worked. We can forget about it. All we care is to atomically perform linearization point on multiple data structures simultaneously. Is the other closing notes, this algorithm is perfect combination for hardware transactional memory. Because it's efficient on one side, but the other side, if we have hardware transactional memory, we could have done this complex atomic operation without all these descriptors. So in the ideal world, where I have access to HTM from a GVM, what I would do, I would start hardware transaction uh, perform my complex atomic iteration without creating any descriptor with zero garbage. And if it successfully commits, I'm fine. I've performed multi-data structure atomic operation. If it fails, this is my fallback. It's still practical, it's still really fast, and I'm, it touches the same words. So it correctly synchronizes with my other, you know, hardware transaction algorithm. So let's take a moment and, and, and you know, enjoy the, what we've accomplished. So we've uh, took really complex, you know, double in Q algorithm, and we managed to uh, perform atomic operations on those multiple objects atomically and combine those atomic operations into one unit in a completely practical way. There is some intermediate garbage those descriptive objects created, but they're really short-lived. I mean, it does not really create it's, I mean, it's really fast in practice, really fast, because, I mean, that's, that's how modern, you know, virtual machines are optimized. So, and uh, for those who are interested in why we do it and what do we do it for, the Kotlin language we work on, it has a separate site, kotlinlang.org, you can learn more about there. And the library that, to support Caroteens that uses those log free algorithms inside is an open source project in itself that lives on GitHub. You can read why curtains needed, how they use them, or you can study the source and see uh, those all those algorithms actually implemented in the code. Thank you, and we can take questions later.